When you think of Halloween, what do you think of? Candy? Costumes? Strapping men in white masks with familial issues and an affinity for kitchen knives? Or perhaps zombies? The latter subject is something that I have a unique interest in. Mindless, shambling corpses that consume any and all life that lies in front of them on an endless quest for brains. Completely bereft of conscious thought. Surely, such creatures are things of myths, legends, or scientific impossibilities. But not so fast, silly viewers. Zombies are real. <laughs> oh, yes. And not only that, they're incredibly common and all around you as we speak. Fungi that likes to get freaky. Surgical wasps that made Charles Darwin question God. Even caterpillars that make entire ant colonies their slaves. All parasites, all real. Not even mankind is safe from the brainwashers. If you've been following the show, you may even remember some of tonight's devious entries. It's the last day of the spooky month, dear viewers. After tonight, you'll tear off your wigs, wipe off your makeup, and hang up the plastic fangs for another 365 days. It's time for one more scare as we delve into the realm of the mind. Tonight is Dr. Bane's Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> Zombies. The Walking Dead. Our culture is obsessed with the rotting shamblers. Hollywood can't get enough of them and video game developers love to implement them wherever possible. It is a simple question though. Why is that? Zombies are the husk of what was once a human now acting of its own ghoulish accord. A bastardization of everything people hold dear about their humanity. A facsimile of mankind that only seeks to feed and reproduce. The subjects in tonight's feature aren't too different from that description. In fact, it's almost down to a T. The only difference is the methods that these creatures use are far more advanced and intriguing than a simple bite, and have served as more than enough inspiration for many nightmares. Now, it's only fitting that we begin with some fan favorites. Some sus fungus, if you will. When anyone speaks of real-life zombies, it's very likely they'll bring up Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, or the classic zombie ant fungus. This mushroom adjacent invader, upon being picked up, drills through the ant's exoskeleton using mechanical pressure and enzymes. Once inside, the fungus we'll term cordyceps so that I don't get tongue-tied in tonight's feature, begins its work of assimilating the flesh of the ant until it reaches the brain which it covers like a sheath. Yes, it doesn't actually enter the brain as I had previously thought. After all, the fungal passenger wouldn't want to crash its host too early, especially with all the sneaking around it'll have to do. Until the cordyceps is ready for the final stage of development, it works the infected ant like a puppet master through the colony to avoid detection by only consuming just enough of the ant's insides to prevent it from stumbling around and alerting its sisters in one of nature's most difficult stealth games. Once the time has come, roughly two to three weeks later, the freshly zombified ant is directed by the cordyceps to leave the colony it was once loyal to. The victim is directed to find a high point above one of the colony's regular trails, and it clamps down firmly on a twig or leaf until the ant expires a few short, painful hours later. Over the next five to ten days, the victorious fungus consumes what's left of its victim and sprouts a fruiting body out of its head, which it will use to start the body snatching cycle all over again. Ophiocordyceps unilateralis is a stealth killer, using its host as a vehicle until the better end. 
It has to be sneaky to ensure its survival because if it were to say, sprout underground while still inside the ant colony, the ants would react in very much the same way you would if a guest decided to collapse in your house after taking a dump on the carpet. And by that I mean it would get thrown out far away from the nest before the fruiting body could fully manifest, rendering the fungus's efforts null. However, on the other side of the stealth spectrum we have Massaspora cicadina. Who couldn't care less who sees it? Massaspora is a fungus specifically evolved to menace the cicadas. It even has a dormancy cycle that matches up quite nicely to that of its host larvae and their eventual emergence every 13 to 17 years. Now talk about synchronizing your watches. After the victim crawls through the infected soil and finishes pupating, the adult cicada emerges with its new parasite in tow. At first, symptoms aren't terribly obvious, but as time goes on, the tree screamer undergoes a gradual transformation. Now, as we all know by now, adult cicadas spend the remainder of time they have on Earth doing three things. F***ing, screaming, and dying. Massaspora disrupts these three tenants by taking away its ability to reproduce and carry its genes to the next generation, which is the main prerogative of all living things on Earth, mind you. This means that the Massaspora infected cicada has just joined the ranks of the sexually undead. Now, allow me to explain that term in more graphic detail and what that means for our dear friend the cicada. The abdomen of the cicada begins to give way to a chalky white substance which is where the fungus holds its spores. As it bears mentioning, the genitals of the insect decay and fall off as its abdomen disintegrates, making it what is dubbed a sexual zombie or a genetic dead end. This doesn't affect the cicada's sex drive though. In fact, the fungus enhances the cicada's need to breed with some well-placed chemicals in the brain. Infected victims, regardless of sex, will exhibit routines that are the same as a female cicada indicating that it's ready to get frisky by flapping their wings in an open space, like a leaf or a branch. Now, one would think that the male cicadas that arrive would see something wrong here, but beauty is a human construct after all. The infected victim goes on to mate with as many cicadas as possible to spread the insect world equivalent to an STD. Once the sexual zombie has had enough or becomes physically unable to, well, live, the husk will fall to the ground, scattering its spores, starting the cycle anew. As you may have noticed, fungal zombifiers run by the same playbook. Scatter your children to the wind and hope for the best. Parasitoid wasps, however, parasitoid meaning that the parasite ends up unaliving its host, don't leave their genetic survival up to the whimsy of air currents. No, no. Instead, they prefer a much more direct approach. Take the emerald wasp, for example. This caring mother will seek out a cockroach, an insect about twice the size of the wasp, and carefully approach like an assassin ready to strike, which for all intents and purposes, it is. Eat your heart out, Ezio. The green mother-in-waiting pounces on the roach and aims for its front legs with its stinger to paralyze them. After scoring a direct hit and disabling the front legs, she'll stab the roach in the head and begin feeling around its brain with her surgical needle of a stinger to find the right spots for her insidious venom. Specifically, she looks for two parts of the roach's brain that deal with locomotion. The wasp then backs away to let the magic happen, and after a few minutes, instead of running off into the night screaming, as some of my lobotomized test subjects do, the roach begins to groom itself vigorously, as though nothing's wrong. And this suits the emerald wasp just fine, as she will return to the roach, tear off the antennae, and drink the blood from the nubs. The victim won't even pull away as the wasp samples it like a sommelier. That's a wine taster, in case like me, you didn't know that that was a word a few hours ago. The mother then grabs the roach by its bloody nubs and leads its zombified guest into a cave before she lays an egg on its underside and then closes off said game. As you may have expected, the wasp larva burrows into the roach and eats around, saving the vital organs for dessert before it pupates and in true xenomorph fashion, emerges from the husk as a new emerald wasp to continue the bloodline. Imagine sleep paralysis, but you're being eaten alive from the inside out for days on end. Much like the emerald wasp, 
Dino Campus Coxinelli doesn't have time for motherly responsibilities and leaves that task to the host of its babies. But why settle for just a larder when you can have that and a bodyguard in the same package? Enter the Garden Variety Ladybug, one of the world's few polka-dotted animals. A female Dinocampus will stab the ladybug with her stinger, as wasps do, and deliver a two-fold package. The wasp injects the victim with its spawn, as well as a specialized virus. The Dinocampus coccinelli paralysis virus, to be exact. It's a real-life Resident Evil bioweapon cooked up by Mother Nature herself. This virus will grow throughout the host as the larva grows, but it won't penetrate the brain until the larva is prepared, like a loaf of bread in a sentient oven. Once the rather large bundle of joy is ready to pop, the tag team of virus and larva goes to work. As the parasitoid works its way straight out through the ladybug's abdomen, the virus finally infects the brain, essentially paralyzing the host. The larva then spins its cocoon under its new brainwashed bodyguard, which will stand on top of it for days as it twitches uncontrollably, fending off most would-be predators like a drunk frat boy. And thanks to the ladybug's diet, most large predators find them unappealing to eat. Unlike the other entries of tonight's feature, however, there's a small light at the end of our polka-dotted friend's tunnel. According to studies, nearly 25% of these zombies are able to come to and return to their aphid buffets shortly after their traumatic experiences. Now, don't say I never give you any happy endings. That'll be the last one for today's episode, so don't worry. Ant colonies are usually thought of as an unbreakable bastion of insect superiority. A veritable army. And while that may be true most of the time, as they have multiple layers of security utilizing select pheromones, clicks, sounds, and etc., you may be surprised to learn that the hive mind can be totally destroyed or zombified by butterflies. Yes, butterflies. Those things that flutter about helplessly in the wind to land on a princess's finger or an outheld rose. Ugh. Indeed, butterflies somewhat regularly invade the homes of ants. Well, at least before they become butterflies, of course. In the example of the creatively named Large Blue Butterfly, the female will locate a certain species of ant, Myrmica ants to be exact. It will do this by tracking the scent of oregano, which releases certain chemical compounds when its roots are disrupted and it's toxic to most ant species, except for Myrmica. The fluttering deliverer of destruction lays an egg on the oregano, and like that one friend who sees the drama ahead of time and wants nothing to do with it, pieces out, likely to find another place to lay her eggs, or perhaps a child's nose to land on or something. A quick fun fact, only 2% of the caterpillar's diet consists of oregano, which means that the other 98% comes from the soon-to-be-invaded ant colony. The caterpillar, after having its fill of oregano flowers, descends into the nest. Sometimes it'll simply drop off the plant and be carried in by ants, thinking that it's one of their own, or sometimes it'll have to put in the legwork and walk in itself. From this point, the story can go one of two ways, depending on the variety of the caterpillar. Scenario 1. It makes its way past the guards and workers of the colony by deploying pheromones similar to the ones that the ants themselves used to trick them. The intruder then finds a secluded cell and waits. Later on, like someone who's found themselves awake at 2.30 a.m. looking for beans, the caterpillar crawls to the spawning chambers and occasionally snacks on the larva inside like oversized and rather juicy potato chips before slinking back to its cell. Scenario 2. The second variety of the caterpillar adopts a cuckoo strategy. It'll enter the nest, as the first one does, but this one will sit with the larvae and, in a bold move, take its place amongst them. Using its false ant pheromones and chirps, it plays the colony like a hive-minded fiddle. The pretender will brainwash its new family and even demand to be fed via regurgitation, which is also called trophallaxis in more polite scientific terms. In dangerous events, like an assault by another colony, the dupes will defend the supposed jumbo larva before they defend their own queen. No, no, put that away. I, I think it's too soon for a pop culture reference. <clears throat> anyway, 
When the colony runs low on food, the ants will slaughter their actual larvae and feed them to the giant doppelganger. That's right. The poor fools chew up their own baby sisters and throw them up into the mouth of the false queen. Nature's beauty knows no bounds. Now, it might be a good time for me to mention that multiple caterpillars can invade at the same time, causing the colony to deteriorate and eventually disappear by consuming their entire next generation. But the story doesn't end there, because there's a twist to this tale of the zombie colony, as certain ichneumon wasps will also descend into its depths. But they don't want an ant army for themselves. No, no, no. They just want to turn the false queen inside into a larder for its young. Yes, I know, not too surprising coming from a parasitoid wasp. What is surprising, though, is the chemical warfare that these wasps use to reach their quarry. They'll simply walk in using pheromones to repel ants and more pheromones at the same time that set the ants into a blind rage on contact. However, rather than destroy the wasp that delivered it to them, they're much more apt to destroy their own sisters. And much like the angry hordes of classic zombie flicks, the ants engage each other in mortal combat as they spread the foreign rage-inducing scents across the colony. Meanwhile, during the insanity, the wasp meanders to the caterpillar's chamber, stabs it, injecting its eggs as wasp tradition dictates, and meanders back out, leaving a trail of chaos and bodies in its wake. Through chemical warfare alone, the wasp has basically lit the colony on fire, and it doesn't even stick around to see the results. I suppose I can't argue with it for being objective. Ah oh, yes, it's a good time to take an intermission. So, has the evening's proceedings been unsettling, unnerving, and downright nasty? Have you seen the cruel theme of nature's machinations against its own creations? And have you at any point of this program said to yourself, Gosh, I'm glad I'm at the top of the food chain and I don't have to worry about my mind being altered in any way. If you haven't, it's about time you start worrying. There are multiple entities and microbes that are more than capable than twisting your brain in knots and making you act in unusual ways. Here's just a couple of examples. Cats are wonderful little creatures. I can attest to this as I have two of my own. They laze about, look adorable, and can do anything a dog can do. That is, if you have a cat trained in the same way our resident psychopath Helix has been. Yes, I may have exploited this segment to talk about my beloved tuxedo, but it's also likely that something has in turn exploited you and your feline friends. Allow me to introduce Toxoplasma gondii. It's a little protozoan that resides in the brains of... Oh, what was it? A complete 11% of the United States population, and up to 60% of the populations of some countries. You could have it right now and be blissfully unaware. But how did the parasite get in your brain in the first place, and what can it do to you? Two important questions, I know. This parasite can be transmitted to humans by raw or unwashed foods, being born from a recently infected mother, and in even rarer cases, ooze cysts, which are microscopic cysts containing zygotes left behind by protozoans, can be transferred in organ transplants. It's also likely that you caught yours from the fur ball sitting behind you. Toxoplasma make their way through your cat's guts after it comes in contact with an infected animal, such as birds, rats, mice, or even other infected cats. Your infected feline is then capable of shedding millions of those oocysts that I mentioned earlier in their poop for up to three weeks after infection. If you haven't been wearing gloves to clean the cat box, then I'd suggest you start, because these parasites come with some pretty interesting side effects, especially for those of you out there with weaker immune systems, like reduced or blurred vision, seizures, swollen lymph nodes, and an intensified need to be around cats, which in turn helps the virus spread even further. Oh, another quick fun fact. In rats, this protozoan causes them to disregard their own rodent lives, as they'll walk right up to cats and other natural predators without a wink. This has resulted in some rather cute videos of mice and rats cuddling cats online. Anyway, this parasite is able to alter your mind, even to the point of making you subconsciously find other individuals infected with toxoplasmosis more attractive. 
A study conducted by the University of Turku has found that humans prefer the looks of those of other infected humans. They even ran the tests on rats, and infected males were preferred in lieu of uninfected ones. The human brain may be one of the most complex in the natural world, but that doesn't make it immune to external manipulation. Or internal manipulation in this case. If you thought having doo-doo worms in your brain was bad, wait until you hear about our next contender. When you think of the stereotypical zombie, what do you imagine? Something unable to control its anger? A creature not unlike a man walking around with its mouth wide open, filled with spit and foam, ready to take a chunk of flesh into its maw. Rotten things that don't swim too well. You may say, Dr. Payne, you're just describing some guy with rabies. And you'd be exactly right. A gold irradiated star for you, rabies, as I'm sure you know, is 100% fatal when symptoms appear. The virus's high mortality rate is mostly due to the way that the virus travels to the brain, as it rides specific proteins along your nervous system, instead of going through your bloodstream where the immune system waits. Once it reaches the brain, the bell tolls for you as symptoms appear. These include heightened aggression, a thickening of the saliva into a foam, and a distinct aversion to water. This viral parasite influences the human mind to fear water so that the previously mentioned virus-packed foam isn't washed out, so that like the classic zombie, the host can bite someone to spread said virus. Even if caretakers try to force the host to drink water, they push away the offering and squirm and writhe to avoid it. Rabies has inspired many entries of zombie literature and media for its ability to completely strip away a person's humanity. Most notably, Richard Matheson's 1954 classic horror story, I Am Legend, which served as one of the first precursors of walking corpse media. It's no wonder that rabies is still one of the most feared diseases of humankind to this day. Despite the vast complexities of the human mind, it is not incorruptible. It can be swayed, hacked, and even fully controlled. The brain remains this way after millions of years of evolution because of the common genetic ancestors that humanity shares with the fungi that can control minds without having a brain themselves, the wasps that perform surprise brain surgeries slash baby showers, the caterpillars that hunger for violence in an army of their own, and even the microscopic terrors such as the rabies virus that twists humanity into a cruel facade of its former self. Cruelty. That's the word I was thinking of. How fascinating it is that nature's cruelty drove these parasites to develop such shrewd and fantastical strategies to exert control over other beings. In short, nature's not in the business of being nice. And parasites of the manipulative sort make up over two-thirds of all life on Earth, which makes humanity part of the minority in the grand scheme of things. Humans may stand tall as the supposed dominant life forms for now, but how long will it be until evolution produces a nightmare to dethrone them and take your minds for a permanent joyride? As it turns out, it could be sooner than you think. <laughs> Happy Halloween, my dear viewers! I'll see you all again in the next video. If you're not a shambling zombie by then, of course. Ha 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 ha!